Good evening, everyone. My name is Zain Al-Hashmi. I'm a Wiser Pioneer and a Senior Sustainability Specialist at ADNOC. On behalf of the entire Wiser Network, I welcome you all to the third edition of the Wiser Wisdom Series. Founded by Mazdar, Wiser, which stands for Women in Sustainability, Environment, and Renewable Energy, is an impact-focused platform dedicated to promote gender equality and inspire women to play an active role in addressing global sustainability challenges. Wiser is proud to have the support of Abu Dhabi Global Market, the award-winning International Financial Center, as a principal partner. Today's webinar will focus on an important topic, how science diplomacy can accelerate climate action and the pivotal role that women can play. Very soon, we'll be hearing from Her Excellency Patricia Fuller, Canada's Ambassador for Climate Change, and Her Excellency Dr. Engineer Nawal al Hosseini, IRENA's permanent representative for the UAE. The session will be moderated by Joanna Osawi, Chair, President, and CEO of Women in Renewable Energy. Thank you all for joining us today. I now invite our moderator, Joanna Osawi, to take over. Enjoy the session, everyone. An honor and privilege to be here with all of you today. A big welcome to everyone joining us from around the world. A big thank you to WISER, Women in Sustainability, Environment and Renewable Energy, and to the Canadian Embassy to the UAE for hosting the Science Diplomacy event. My name is Joanna Osawe, and I am the President and CEO of WIRE, Women in Renewable Energy. Our goal and mission is simple. It is to advance the role and recognition of women in the energy sector. Today's event is a collaboration among the global scientific community in unlocking policy solutions to some of the world's most intractable problems, with technology reshaping virtually every sector of our societies and economies, particularly in the wake of COVID-19. The indications are that science diplomacy will become an increasingly important aspect of international relations in the future. During this session, our distinguished guests will discuss how nations can successfully combat the growing threat of climate change through science diplomacy, touching on the crucial role of women in leading these efforts. The overall objective of the webinar is to underscore the importance of science diplomacy in relation to climate change while considering the global pandemic, which has spurred the public and private sectors to re-examine what it means to build back better. This week, also marks the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement, the ambitious international agreement that addresses climate change. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our panelists. Her, Her Excellency Dr. Noel al Hussani, UAE's permanent representative to IRENA. Her Excellency Dr. Noel al Hussani is the permanent representative of the United Arab Emirates to the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA a role she has held since April 2018. She has also held position as Executive Director of Sustainability at Mazdar, Abu Dhabi's renewable energy company, the Director of the Zayed Future Energy Prize, the UAE's annual global awards for renewable energy and sustainability. She also served as Deputy Director General of the Emirates Diplomatic Academy, EDA, between 2017 and 2018. Dr. Noel is also accredited as one of the first two Emirati women to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. A very big welcome to Ambassador Patricia Fuller, Canada's Ambassador for Climate Change. Ambassador Patricia Fuller was named Canada's Ambassador for Climate Change on June 5, 2018 for a term of three years. She has served abroad as Ambassador of Canada to Uruguay from 2004 to 2007 and as ambassador to Chile from 2012 to 2015. Previous international assignments also included Mexico and Guatemala. In Ottawa, Ms. Fuller has, speci has specialized in trade and economic policy, as well as climate change and energy. At Candace Warren Ministry, she served as deputy director for two trade remedies, 1997 to 1999, director of the Softwood Lumber Division from 2003 to 2004, Chief Economist from 2007 to 2010, Director General of Planning and Reporting from 2010 to 2012, and Director General of Economic Development 2017 to 2018. She was seconded to Natural Resources Canada from 2015 to 2017 to head up the Office of Energy Efficiency. 
So a big warm welcome to both our fantastic panelists and our subject matter experts. So our topic today centers on the concept of science diplomacy. And before we delve into things, I would like to start by asking both of you how the UAE and Canada define science diplomacy. Your Excellency, Dr. Noel, can we please start with you? Hello, thank you very much for having me and it is an absolute pleasure to be here today and I'm very grateful for the opportunity and honor to be with, uh, with you know, such an amazing platform. Uh, there is sometimes people would think there is like a contradiction between uh, science and diplomacy and I think uh, there, I, 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 the way we see it, the work with, with, with empirical evidence that we offer, that is offered by science is the way for us to see it more complementary. So science gives us evidence on the situation current or in the future and offer guidance and advice uh, on how to respond to different uh, challenges. Soft power, which is core to diplomacy, takes this into account, but also other factors and circumstances and tries to find measures which attract or persuade others to join uh, the path and be it through culture, economy, political values, foreign policy, quality of life, and robust uh, academic institution that is also in terms of, of taking over leadership roles. The UAE have shown clear leadership guiding many other nations to act very similar. For example, uh, one of the most recent examples are the Abrahamic uh, Accords on a political and regional level, and we can see other GCC countries following our first step or our response to the current COVID pandemic and our humanitarian support. All those are examples of how the UAE has shown leadership in using uh, diplomacy to advance its policies. Today, we see that the UAE in response to the COVID crisis provided over 1,613 metric tons of aid to 120 countries in need, supporting more than 1.6 million medical professionals in the process. And you know you can see in studies as are recognizing this role. So, for example, uh, a recent uh, survey done by uh, Brand Finance on soft power saw that the UAE was ranking in the 18th position of 60 countries and number one uh, in the Middle East when it comes to soft power. Uh, the strength of the UAE is being uh, perceived uh, as an appealing business environment and a stable economy less in the field of technology, but we are expecting this to change, uh, for example, due to the recent launch of HOPE, our probe to the UAE's mission to Mars. Uh, the UAE, uh, if we're going to look also on what we are talking about today, which is climate change, you see, you see how the UAE is looking at climate change, although we are relatively a uh, smaller nation and we can have limited action points to mitigate climate change, but we can help and facilitating discussion, convening decision makers, and listening to the scientists, taking over an active leadership uh, role to convince people of the world to change. For example, 10 years ago, we're looking at our host mustard. 10 years ago, the UAE has only, only had 10 megawatts of solar power installed in Mustard City, which is a 10 megawatt PV plant. Uh, at that time, the cost of renewable energy was very expensive, but we, we were a champion of the idea, we stick to it, and since then, from 2015 until today, every year, the UAE has a major announcement on the lowest cost of electricity. And very, very recently, in 2020, Mustard is part of that consortium. We secured a bidder for a Bafra PV plant of 200 megawatt, or sorry, 2,000 megawatt for 1.35 uh, cents per kilowatt. So achieving these competitive prices when it comes to renewable, providing affordable uh, energy to the poorest people living in the most remote areas, suggest that, uh, that that's basically what the world needed. Today, we have, in, in 2010, we had uh, more than 1.2 billion people without access to electricity. This number in 2017 was reduced to 840 uh, million only. So looking at the UAE, our soft power approach is reflected in our humanitarian work. And the achievement of sustainable development goals has been and always fundamental to our humanitarian work through supporting the achievement in, in the UAE and globally. So since 2013, just to give you another example, the UAE contributed more than $1 billion in aid to developing countries to implement renewable energy projects 
transport those countries and those communities. Um, one example is the Abu Dhabi Fund for Development Facility in collaboration with IRENA. Uh, that is $350 million. In 2013, we launched $50 million uh, UAE Pacific Partnership Fund. And uh, in 2017, we launched the $50 million UAE Caribbean Renewable Energy Fund that created opportunities and provided uh, support for those, country, for those countries. So, Coming back to, to your question about the aspect, aspect of science uh, diplomacy, and based on the approach that the UAE is doing, uh, we can see that for the UAE that it has been always very, very important, and, and the definition has been very important for us. Um, uh, science provides advice to inform foreign policy, diplomacy facilitated international scientific cooperation and vice versa, scientific cooperation improved international relations. And we see that how the UAE is doing it. And if we look, if we zoom into uh, climate change, we see how we can understand the climate change and how the UAE is using it to uh, advance uh, its relationship and agenda based on empirical data and the impact of climate change. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Ambassador Fuller, if you can please define the term from the Canadian perspective. Thank you, Joanna. And let me start by congratulating Wiser and Wire for this collaboration that uh, we're taking part in today. I think it's wonderful that these two organizations from Canada and from the UAE are coming together to, to, to host this event and, and to talk about this important topic of, of science and the role of women in, in, in science. So I congratulate you. Uh, for, for Canada, uh, certainly uh, science, science diplomacy is uh, a very important term because Canada believes that science is fundamental to guide our public policy actions and, and cooperating internationally on science uh, is uh, not only a way to address shared challenges, but it's also a way to build relationships with other countries that can contribute to to uh, international peace and, and security. Uh, and uh, so for Canada, if we think about areas of important scientific uh, collaboration around shared challenges, the Arctic uh, stands out as, as an area where uh, Canada and other Arctic nations have collaborated closely together on science for uh, a very long time, really, throughout history. We can think back even to the Cold War years where, where that scientific collaboration uh, among the polar countries con continued and, and continues to this, to this day. Uh, today, of course, we're, we're, we're facing an enormous challenge which is driving scientific collaboration at an unprecedented pace, and that is the COVID pandemic. And I think it's just so encouraging to see how scientific collaboration has has uh, achieved in such a short period of time uh, an un unprecedented result of, of uh, uh, the uh, um, the finding and, and rolling out of, of vaccines against the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So that is an enormous uh, achievement of scientific collaboration. Uh, turning to climate change, uh, the, um, the Paris Agreement really can be seen as a result of scientific diplomacy in the sense that, that the International Panel on Climate Change, which is uh, also a, a, a standout example of, of, of science diplomacy and, and, and scientific collaboration. It is the guidance of the science in the IPCC, which uh, led to the defining of the temperature goals for the Paris Agreement. Uh, the Paris Agreement explicitly states the goal of keeping global warming to less than two degrees Celsius and to work towards 1.5 degrees. And then subsequent to the Paris Agreement, we saw the 1.5 degree report from the IPCC, which uh, outlined just how important it is to achieve the 1.5 degree goal. 
and that has led to uh, a, a redefining of, of ambition and uh, uh, a shared uh, consensus that uh, uh, parties to the Paris Agreement need to need to increase our ambition in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And just um, uh, I would like to to mention also as part of um, the uh, uh, the sharing of knowledge through through the uh, uh, the Paris Agreement and and the UNFCCC process. Uh, Canada has played a leadership role in the establishment of the Indigenous platform, and I mention that because traditional knowledge is an important element of science as well. And in Canada, we're doing uh, more and more to bring uh, Indigenous knowledge into uh, the picture as far as uh, uh, discussions and, and, and learning of the impact of climate change, uh, uh, because those observations from <clears throat> based on, on uh, millennia of, of knowledge of, of our natural environment are an important contribution to understanding the changes that uh, that we're seeing in, in our natural world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Fuller. Your Excellency, Dr. Noel, you have witnessed firsthand the role of science, the potency as it relates to climate change and the UAE's foreign policies. In the UAE, the government has utilized a range of initiatives in IRENA and Mazdar to better shape the science diplomacy agenda. How has science diplomacy advanced the UAE's efforts to shape its policies and combat climate change? Thank you for this interesting question. Uh, the UAE has rightly so put the scientific methods at the center of much of its policy making throughout the years. COVID-19 is, is just reinforced that. Uh, with, with our 2050 energy strategy, the UAE has pledged an unwavering commitment to overseeing the global energy transition by advocating, advocating and implementing renewable energy projects and solutions both at home and joint partnership in developing countries from the Caribbean all the way to uh, the Seychelles and Afghanistan. These projects are direct result of a form of science uh, diplomacy. Uh, at home, uh, as you, may, you might know, uh, a very high percentage of our food supply is imported. Even if climate change does not ha does have maybe limited impact in the UAE, which uh, in, in comparison to other countries, it, it will impact the countries which grow most of our uh, food supply. So it's important, science is very important for us to understand what might happen. Data management, data exchange is very important for us, including the linkage and the feedback loops to, uh, to this. Uh, that will lead to, to clearly very useful results to combine observation and measurements globally, as, uh, as Ambassador Fuller mentioned, to complete uh, a complex model and how we can work together. We've seen from the COVID pandemic that we have to emphasize on our food and water security. And based on this, the UAE, uh, as we speak, shaping policies to support local farmers, entrepreneurs, and startups. New technological approaches, for example, uh, we see it. Uh, a very recent example, if you look at policy level, we saw a reshuffle this summer of our government that created a new ministry looking into industries and advanced technologies. And very recently, the minister of this, of this ministry, His Excellency Dr. Sultan Jabir, was announced as the special envoy for climate change. So this is shows how important the UAE is putting both on science and technology to address climate change. Another example is, uh, I, I keep mentioning this, but because it's very important, how we responded to the current pandemic. Based on scientific advice, how the virus is spreading, how the UAE has helped us and other governments to create policies and regulations to combat this virus. The pandemic taught us that we have to work together, we have to get quickly as much information on the virus and how to treat it and share with, with the world. Thank you. Ambassador Fuller, Canada is committed to helping the most vulnerable communities adapt to climate change, mitigate its impacts, and by leveraging private sector involvement, facilitate the transition to a low carbon economy. How has Canada engaged with the multilateral institutions such as the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change 
and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to further their policies and programming on climate change. Uh, certainly, climate change does uh, affect the most vulnerable uh, the most, and that is the tragedy of, of climate change, that those who contribute the least, uh, we think about uh, countries that are buffeted by hurricanes, small island states, for example, who have contributed very little in terms of greenhouse gases that are in the atmosphere now, and yet are, are, are most vulnerable to their impacts. So uh, a, a very important part of the Paris Agreement is the commitment of, of uh, developed countries to provide support to developing countries to mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but also to adapt to the impact of climate change. Uh, we collectively set the goal of mobilizing $100 billion uh, by uh, this year, by 2020, on an annual basis. Um, and Canada has been working very hard towards uh, the achievement of, of that goal. Uh, we have uh, uh, almost completed the, the, the current five-year cycle of our climate finance of $2.65 billion. And an important area for Canada has been, uh, through that financing, to mobilize private sector finance. Uh, as we realize that uh, public monies are not sufficient to meet the, the challenge that is required uh, for combating climate change. So how do we do that? Um, we have been working uh, through the multilateral development banks uh, to uh, provide what is called blended financing as a way of reducing uh, risk of projects, uh, for example, renewable energy projects in uh, markets which uh, uh, where renewable energy is not yet well developed. And so through, um, through the multilateral development banks, Canada has supported uh, many projects around the world uh, in, uh, uh, that are led by private sector uh, proponents. And the idea is, with those model projects in place, other investments will follow without the need for support from, from the public sector. Uh, so, so that's been a very important element of, of our, our work uh, uh, in the context of the Paris Agreement. Uh, of course, uh, the, the agreement also entails uh, the reduction of, of uh, uh, all of our emissions, and Canada is, is, is uh, uh, working to meet our current uh, uh, nationally determined contribution. We have just released a plan uh, to exceed that that uh, target, and have committed to to bringing forward a more ambitious uh, uh, target before COP26 in in Glasgow. And we're pleased to say we're we have been leaders in in collaborating with other countries to ensure the effective implementation of the Paris Agreement. Uh, we co-chair with the European Union and China, the Ministerial on Climate Action, which brings together a group of leading countries in the Paris Agreement to, to uh, support its uh, effective implementation. Uh, and we've also led complementary initiatives like the Powering Past Coal Alliance, which we lead with the United Kingdom, which is aimed at the very important uh, uh, challenge of phasing out coal because coal is such an important component of global greenhouse gas emissions in terms of uh, what is produced by, by uh, uh, coal-fired electricity. So um, the goal is to phase out coal and, and to come together as an alliance of countries who are committed to that objective. Thank you, Ambassador Fuller. Your Excellency, Dr. Noel. I would like to move on to the other focus area, the topic that the WISER platform is all about gender equality and women empowerment. Gender inequality and social exclusion constrain women from equally participating in science and policy discussions on sustainable development and climate change specifically. Are there examples of how the UAE has brought these issues to the fore in international policy discussions, negotiations, or programming? Thank you, Joanna. Uh, um, 
a lot of people know that achieving the right gender balance has been core pillar to the UAE since the foundation of the nation. And just a couple of, just actually yesterday, we, the UAE was ranked number 18th globally and first Arab country in the UN Development Gender Inequality Index. That's basically a testimony of a very pragmatic approach by the government to, to do so. The UAE, we look at engaging more women in science diplomacy, both in terms of leveling the playing field for both genders, but also in terms of the UN Sustainability Development Goals, which is goal, goals 10 and 11, specifically for reduced inequality and sustainable uh, communities. Uh, we can achieve both by involving more women in science diplomacy, uh, which we have done by incentivizing and encouraging more women to take up roles in this field. And one, one clear example for us is Her Excellency uh, Sarah Amiri, who is leading our Mars mission. She is also our Minister of State for, scientific, uh, uh, for, for Science and Technology. Uh, if we look at the light of the Paris Agreement goals, and, and we said that uh, before, uh, and this is, has been our, the approach for, for the UAE, uh, the problem we are facing with our climate uh, is inherently, there's nothing about it that is muscular. So it's, it's a global, it's a global problem. And we are facing, uh, we shouldn't, it shouldn't be a problem that just men are tasked to, to solve it. So because of this perspective and the approach to renewable energy and climate action field, the number of young Emirati women uh, now holding positions and entering STEM careers is becoming uh, very, very high. And this, again, is a result of conscious efforts to create the conditions and encourage uh, more women in this field uh, rather than prevent it. You know, in, in every negotiating table, uh, either uh, with COP meetings or, or for the sustainable energy for all or any other platforms, you will always find more Emirati women on those uh, negotiating tables than any other uh, country's delegation. Thank you very much. So women in every region of the world are often environmental stewards from collecting water to gathering food. They interact with natural resources daily, they are also uniquely affected by the damaging effects of climate change. Ambassador Fuller, how can we ensure that women have a seat at the table to contribute to climate action? Well, certainly the government of Canada has placed gender equality at the center of its agenda. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, upon entering office, made a very strong commitment to gender equality, and that's the manifested uh, through gender equality in our cabinet and, and uh, through the uh, introduction of uh, gender-based analysis or GBA plus as it's called in our budgeting process uh, and uh, our gender results framework uh, which is a, a world-leading example introduced in, in 2018. Uh, so we're doing it at home uh, and uh, uh, in terms of our, our uh, support for women uh, globally in meeting the climate crisis, we have made gender equality a central part of our what we call our feminist international assistance policy. Uh, so all of our international assistance is driven by the, the, the belief that uh, the results of our work are better when they advance gender equality and when women's leadership is uh, brought to to the uh, the challenges that uh, we are supporting people in, in meeting. So um, we, uh, in all of our projects uh, that we support through our international assistance, uh, seek to advance gender equality, and we have very specific targets around. Uh, how that assistance is allocated in terms of projects that are entirely focused on gender equality versus projects which have gender equality among a series of, 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 of goals. Um, in fact, uh, it was uh, a, uh, uh, a World Bank uh, uh, project or, or fund that brought me to the United Arab Emirates uh, a couple of years ago when I uh, sat on the board of the Women's Entrepreneur Financing Facility, and we had a meeting, uh, a, a board meeting in, in Dubai. So, so it has been uh, a central part of our international assistance. 
And uh, with respect to climate change, uh, we, we recognize that women are disproportionately affected by climate change. Uh, so it is very important to, to uh, focus on uh, supporting women in, in, and, and, and building their agency in, in uh, the projects we support in developing countries uh, for uh, adaptation to climate change. But also with respect to the scientific field, um, we have, um, for example, through our international uh, development uh, 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 research uh, um, institution, uh, the, the IDRC, uh, we have supported uh, initiatives such as the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences Next Einstein Initiative. This is a fellowship program for, for women in, in climate change. Uh, so that is an example of, of, sci of scientific uh, 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 programming that uh, is aimed at advancing uh, gender equality. Um, and in terms of the actual negotiations for the uh, UNFCCC, uh, we have uh, supported the training of women negotiators uh, for um, uh, to increase the participation of women in the UNFCCC. Triple C process. So we supported the training of uh, of uh, women negotiators for Franco Francophone Africa and also for the the uh, the Caribbean. Thank you very much. So moving on uh, to the following question: The global pandemic has highlighted that no country exists in isolation. Result resolving the COVID nineteen crisis, like resolving the climate crisis requires strong international cooperation. As more governments pledge to build a better future, ambitions to decarbonize various sectors of the economy may be gaining ground. This could suggest faster adoption of green policies and technologies in general. Your Excellency, Dr. Noel, how can governments leverage science diplomacy to advance solutions that target the pandemic and climate change? Uh, it's very critical to, uh, as Ambassador Fuller mentioned, the international cooperation. It's extremely vital and important. And the UAE is an active member of many international institutions. Uh, we have, uh, this is our way that we see ourselves as a convener and a facilitator. For more than a decade, we host Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week at the beginning of the year. We invite international audience to Abu Dhabi to discuss the global response to climate change and improve our sustainability. We host many events in partnership with international organizations such as the UNFCCC in preparation to the climate change. And one, one, of, uh, uh, one of our biggest events, uh, which was about to unfold in October 2021, is the Dubai Expo with the theme Connecting Minds, Creating the Future, and sub sub themes of opportunity, mobility, and sustainability. Uh, the UAE is also the host country to the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA, which is a universal, uh, has now a universal membership of uh, 162 countries and 22 states in accession. Uh, we also host the Regional Collaboration Center in Dubai. It's a collaboration between the UN Climate Change and the World Green Economy Organization uh, with the support of the UAE government that is dedicated to advancing the goals of the uh, Paris Climate Change Agreement in the Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia. So going beyond the achievement of our national goals, the UAE is committed to fulfilling our global commitment, such as uh, the Paris Agreement and the SDG. And we have uh, actively engaged on international uh, climate change and sustainable development negotiation to ensure that our interest is protected. Uh, inclusion and science diplomacy is very important for us. Women in every region of the world, to your point, are, uh, uh, are often environmental stewards from, uh, uh, in, in many levels. And we are, uh, women are uniquely affected by the damaging effect of climate change. So we look at gender equality and social uh, exclusion as constraints to uh, women from participating equally to science and technology. So we, we work together to ensure that those barriers are being uh, removed and engaging more women in this sector. 
Thank you very much. The focus of the upcoming year will no doubt be on how we can work together to ensure a green recovery. In your opinion, Ambassador Fuller, can science diplomacy contribute to the kinds of system, systemic changes related to climate change as part of the post-COVID-19 recovery? Yes, certainly. I think that the clearest example of that is, uh, and it's very heartening that in this in this terrible year of the pandemic, we have at the same time seen an uh, increasing number of countries committed to the goal of net zero emissions. And that goal is a goal dictated by science. It, it, is, it is the scientists who have told us that uh, by mid-century, uh, greenhouse gas emissions have to, to reach net zero if we're to stabilize uh, uh, climate change and, and, and avoid its, its most uh, catastrophic impacts. Uh, so, so that net zero emissions goal uh, is one that um, uh, Canada has committed to, and we have recently introduced legislation to, to uh, ensure that our, our government is held accountable to set targets uh, on the way to 2050 uh, that will get us to that, that destination of net zero emissions. Um, and 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 uh, how we do that, and how we take advantage of the current context, which you know, as difficult as it is, it is an opportunity to steer investments towards green and sustainable uh, uh, projects and and investments. Uh, so as we institute. Uh, uh, policies and programs to stimulate economic recovery, uh, climate change will be a, a cornerstone uh, of uh, of our approach. Um, in the the uh, climate plan that that uh, our our government released last last Friday, uh, which I mentioned earlier, this is the plan that will enable us to exceed our our current uh, target under the Paris Agreement and to establish a more ambitious, nationally determined contribution. Uh, you can see how uh, climate uh, policies will drive uh, innovation and, and clean technology development. Uh, a central part of our climate plan is carbon pricing. And uh, the effect of putting a price on carbon uh, makes clean technologies more competitive. So, when uh, we price uh, pollution or when we price greenhouse gas emissions, that means that companies that are advancing clean technologies, for example, renewable energy uh, uh, companies, uh, have uh, uh, a more level playing field. It, 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 makes, it takes into account the, the, uh, uh, the costs of, uh, of, of emissions to uh, to the to the atmosphere, it takes that into account and and uh, means that uh, polluters uh, pay for their for their emissions. So so that's an important feature of our plan. But also um, the range of, of other measures in the plan that will uh, support the development of of um, Clean energy and clean technologies across the, across all sectors, and and specific investments to help uh, companies invest in clean technologies. There are specific funds to to support that. So all in all, it means that uh, uh, climate change uh, will be a, a cornerstone of uh, of our our green recovery, uh, and uh, the plan we've put in place will ensure that. Uh, uh, that clean technology is central to that. And just um, uh, in closing, I'd also like to note that uh, we're we're very proud that we have uh, uh, a, a wide range of clean technology leaders, uh, companies in Canada that are working around the world uh, to advance clean energy and clean technology projects, whether it be in, in hydrogen or or uh, carbon capture and storage or renewable energy. Uh, many areas where we see Canadian clean tech leaders uh, working towards uh, meeting the environmental challenges around around the world. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Ambassador Fuller. 
Thank you so much uh, for both your insights, for being leaders, for being champions. Uh, you know, thank you again for your valuable time. Um, you know, Your Excellency Dr. Noel and Ambassador Fuller, uh, we will now invite questions from our international audience. So one of um, most people think of only governments relying on science diplomacy and um, how can the private sector make use of science diplomacy to achieve their goals? I'm going to actually pass this on to our uh, audience member, Sean Robertson, to ask the question to our fantastic panelists. So over to you, Sean. Okay, maybe what I can do is uh, ask this question for Sean, but uh, the question, like I said, was most people think of only government relying on science diplomacy. So how can the private sector make use of science diplomacy to achieve their goals? Um, you know, Your Excellency Dr. Noel or Ambassador Fuller, I welcome uh, either of you to, uh, you know, pose to answer this question. Uh, I'm happy to start. So uh, I think uh, science is, is extremely uh, important uh, um, tool for any organization. I don't think it's only the government. I think private sector, civic society, it's, it's basically it's the tool for you to, to be able to have empirical data to achieve your targets. So for the private sector, it's very important because it helps them to create opportunities for the region they are working in, understanding the scientific evidence and data of the value and the benefit of their product, they are selling product. It's the best way to promote that product. So using the empirical data to help uh, either create market or tap into a bigger market, attract the right talent because, you know, the youth now are extremely um, 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 aware and very interested to be in a field or an industry that's basically in line with their own values and in their own beliefs. So for the uh, for organizations that are for the private sector, which is competing now globally on talent and specifically for youth, very important to use uh, science diplomacy to promote their uh, their their business models, their products, their interest in in order to for them to gain access to either a new market or access to talent but also to be able to differentiate themselves from their competitors so it, it, it gives them competitive advantage and it does give them a, a, a very important um, uh, as, as i said like a, a headway to uh, to to access to tap into talent and tap into market thank you for that and Ambassador Fuller? Yes, I, I would uh, echo that. I, I have seen that firsthand in, in Canada's clean tech sector, where uh, uh, whereas in perhaps more uh, uh, traditional companies, they are experiencing challenges in finding uh, uh, scientific talent, engineers, and so forth. Uh, talking to leaders of, of Canadian clean tech firms, they tell me that uh, uh, they have young people flocking to their doors because of that value point that uh, Dr. Nawal Alzani Al has just made, that uh, uh, that uh, youth would like to work in a context that is aligned with their their value, and that is a important. Uh, um, advantage in terms of uh, of, of recruitment that, uh, uh, that that we see here in Canada as well. Thank you very much. I'm going to actually ask uh, Amina to come online and to pose another question to uh, both of you. So Amina, I welcome you. Okay. Hi everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. No. Okay. So, okay. My name is Amna Al-Ghili. I am a fresh graduate from the Higher College of Technology. 
um, with a Bachelor in Education. So you both are inspiring me a lot. Um, so now I'm focusing more about my career. So I need your advice on the skills and training that I need to do, uh, like to achieve what you are doing right now. Thank you. Well, maybe I can can start did you on hear that, me, shall I? Yes, yes, I did. Um, uh, very, very nice to hear your question. And and you know, I would say uh, that uh, the passion that you bring to what you do, when I hear that in your voice, that that is that is your greatest asset. So I would say whatever field you choose uh, and wh whichever type of role you you uh, choose to pursue that that uh, we need young people passionate like you who are seeking to make a difference we have an enormous uh, challenge that we face uh, this generation that we face in terms of what what is is required to meet the challenge of, of climate change uh, but also in incredible opportunities as, as we make these transformations. So, so more than the specific skills, which I think, you know, there's skills required in really all sectors of the, of the economy and all sectors of science to meet this challenge. So rather than sort of specific fields of study, I would more suggest that you bring that, that object of, 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 uh, urgency and passion and the need to Question: How um, we we do things now, and why why how can we move more quickly uh, to make the transformations that that we need to make? And I I always uh, like to underline that uh, youth have uh, uh, an incredible uh, moral authority in in this uh, environment that we find ourselves in, in that you will bear the costs of climate change. Uh, when those uh, of us are are long gone, uh, so it's the younger generation who who will face uh, these consequences uh, more acutely. So um, bring that to the table, and and uh, and and in whatever area you choose to work in, seek to push for for transformative change that will that will enable us to meet the the challenge of, of, of climate change. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador. For, if, if I may add, I think that's a very, very important point uh, because uh, it, it, it's the mindset, it's the passion, it's, it's the willingness to tap into, you know, something that you don't know. Never settle of and think that, you know, I've, I've got my bachelor degree now, I know it all, I am, you know, I'm, I've, I'm, I'm done with education, I'm done with training, I'm subject matter expert. You need to keep pursuing uh, knowledge, keep pursuing education, and not necessarily only uh, academic knowledge, but it's really important that we learn and we learn more is from our network. So as the bigger your network, the, the more you are tapping into people that are outside of your immediate circle, that is very, very important. And for me personally, this is what helped me become the person I am today. I have friends from all over the world and I always tap into them either for uh, an, um, an, an actual advice on a challenge I'm, I'm, I'm facing or to understand how they themselves address something that they are going through. And it's, it's, it's this wealth, the true wealth, and it's the real wealth of any human being is the the network that they have. And this network can be, you know, as big or as small as you want it to be, because how you leverage, how you how you keep nurture this network is your responsibility. And this is for me that has been one of the core pillar of of the reason that made me the person I am today. And for that I will always be grateful. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you so much. Inshallah we'll be working on this to reach what you are uh, doing now. Thank you so much. I'm sure you have uh, even a higher horizons to reach because it's never been a better time to be a youth as Master Fuller mentioned. It's incredible the opportunities that you guys have, the voices that you have, that uh, the youth now have, and the access to information and knowledge, everything now, you know, given what, what we've seen with COVID, all universities in the world, all academic institutions, all companies and organizations are 
extending and giving uh, free and equal access to all to those platforms and information. So the, the decision is basically now is in your hands, where you want to be and how you want to tap into those information. You know, all those forums now are for free and people, they just need to allocate time and just dial in and, and, and listen and learn. Thank you very much, Amina. We appreciate your question. Before we close off, uh, any final words from Your Excellency, Dr. Noel or Ambassador Fuller? Ambassador, you start. I started with the question. Okay, thank you, Dr. Noel. Uh, well, uh, just to, to say uh, again how pleased I am that uh, Wiser and Wire have come together as uh, two organizations uh, uh, to put this together today. Uh, uh, I appreciate your focus on, on science, which is so all important to all of our challenges of today and tomorrow. And uh, I hope that this leads to further uh, collaborations between the UAE and, and Canada, particularly in the, in the clean technology field, where uh, I, uh, I think there is uh, a, lot, uh, a lot that we can do together. So it, it's been a pleasure to, to be here with you today. Thank you very would, much. And I will, I will echo that, and I would uh, send a, a, a very warm uh, message of appreciation to uh, Wiser team and Master team under the leadership of Dr. Lemia and uh, her team and Zainab and Michelle and, every, and everybody. And thank you, Joanna, for uh, moderating such an, uh, an, uh, a very important session. So it has been a pleasure. Uh, those those topics are. But, extreme importance and spreading awareness about them is is, is critical to, to to our mission to address the, our global challenge together uh, I would say uh, stay safe and healthy everybody and uh, I, I look forward to uh, you know engaging on, on 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 bigger platforms and more platforms as, as we move on into a covid free uh, world hopefully in 2021. A huge thank you again to Your Excellency Dr. Noel and Ambassador Fuller, to Wiser and the Canadian Embassy to the UAE for hosting us today, and to all of our distinguished guests for attending the third edition of the Wiser Wisdom Series. I hope you all found it engaging and enlightening. We'll be sending a survey to you shortly and appreciate if you survey to you shortly and appreciate if you can complete. We look forward to seeing you all again at our next session. Stay safe, everyone, and thank you again for your valuable time and thank you so much to you both for bringing so much empowering messages and being such leaders and global leaders. Um, you know, you truly are uh, our role model. So thank you again for empowering all of us uh, today. So with that being said, stay safe, everyone, and stay healthy. Thank you.